Hello class, welcome back to our next set of notes here on the Living World Unit. We're diving into the uh, second section here talking about biomes. Um, so biomes are kind of split into two types here, terrestrial and aquatic biomes, and we're going to cover both of those uh, key components uh, today. So the first slide here, we're going to go through a bunch of vocabulary and just uh, really outline some key components here for you. The, uh, the first thing we're going to look at are some terms that we should be familiar with. So the first one, atom and molecule, terms from chemistry. Uh, we get cell, tissue, organ, organ system. These are things that we've talked about in our biology classes here. Um, and we get a little more of the biology overlap when we start talking about organisms. And then we get into ecology, which is our you know, populations, communities, ecosystems. These are all terms that we'll get into in more detail again in this class but things we covered in biology uh, at a basic level. Uh, our focus today is going to be biomes and this is our definition a collection of ecosystems that share similar climates uh, so we should know that that's what a biome is and then uh, biomes all together make up a biosphere which is the earth's air water and soil uh, the areas of the planet where life is found so we're kind of making our hierarchy from small to big basically all right a biosphere obviously all-encompassing containing a lot of different uh, types of plants and animals, living and non-living components. Uh, biomes are these special areas in our ecosystems um, that share those similar climate, climates and conditions. Uh, so when we're looking at uh, our biome map here, we're going to kind of go through in some different kind of uh, way to look at it, different layers. Everything that's in red here are biomes that we need to know uh, about and know their locations. Um, so there's a label it. Uh, tag here. Uh, we're going to get a map in class and label these up um, in a lot of detail. Uh, so right now, um, just to kind of review, we have the, the cold biomes. These are higher latitudes, 60 plus degrees up on the map, when latitudes are the horizontal lines that you see um, running from left to right on a map here. Uh, so the dotted line, Tropic of Cancer, Equator, Tropic of Capricorn down here, 60 degree latitude is pretty high up uh, above where we're located here in Wisconsin. Uh, cold biomes, our main cold biomes is Arctic tundra, sometimes referred to as cold grassland, and the taiga biome, which is the boreal coniferous forest. The next biomes we're looking at are temperate biomes. These are kind of between the 30 degree, 60 degree latitudes um, highlighted in the yellow box here. And uh, all the ones that are circled on our key temperate grassland, Shrublands, uh, temperate deciduous forest, this is our home biome, uh, temperate rainforest, and then also deserts down at the bottom there. Uh, so looking at this, uh, all of these, this is kind of a good diversity of biomes as we stretch across uh, the planet's uh, landmass here. Uh, and you can see the different colors, each indicating different biomes. So there's a most diversity uh, of biomes located between 30 and 60 degrees latitudes. Uh, the final one are tropical biomes. These are primarily the savannas, which are tropical grasslands, and uh, our tropical rainforest biomes. Um, we certainly have this kind of sub-designation of tropical dry forest, which we're, we're not going to get into. That's very specific. But understand that in a tropical kind of band there in green, savannas and tropical rainforests are going to be the big ones that we see. Uh, when looking at biomes, it's important to know that we say these are similar climatic conditions. We're talking about typically temperature and precipitation. Um, so these ecosystems share those uh, on average temperature precipitation amounts. Um, this over here on the right side is a climate graph. Climate graphs, we should be able to make good educated guesses about what biomes we're looking at um, based on precipitation, which are the bars here, the blue bars, and temperature uh, changes. And these are all monthly, right? So average values for each month. Um, so based on the changes we see here, in temperature and precipitation, we should be able to narrow it down to at least two different biomes um, to make decisions on. So we'll practice that skill in class. We'll just know the bar graph is, is precipitation and the line is temperature. So we'll draw an example of that in your notes. Uh, understand that biomes are dynamic. Um, you know, geography, latitude, altitude, nutrients, soil uh, quality all contribute to the biome's characteristics, uh, but that latitude helps to really um, kind of nail down the most important uh, kind of pattern that we see 
uh, globally with biome distribution. Uh, biomes will change and shift due to changes in climate. All right, changes in average temperature and precipitation as those change over time, uh, your biomes kind of move, so they're dynamic in that way. Um, the notes from here on out, we want to record uh, in a chart similar to this. So we'll try to provide one of those to you ahead of time. Uh, if not, we could easily make a chart like this in your notebook. Uh, we'll leave your room for those nine biomes we talked about. So our first biome, we got the distribution in general here in light blue on the map. Uh, up at the top, so we'll kind of work top to bottom. Uh, tundra, know that these are, are Arctic tundras, cold, uh, long dark winters, uh, frozen ground. I refer to it as permafrost, so that's an important vocab term, permanently frozen, permanently frosted. Um, uh, temperature range obviously doesn't get too, too warm in the summers, um, and the summer season is very short. Uh, less than 250 millimeters per year of precipitation, which is pretty low. Uh, insulation, not a lot of sunlight. Insulation, sunlight, that's low. And limiting factors, water temperature, insulation. So very um, inhospitable biome to a lot of plant and animal life. Um, and they have to be specially adapted to survive. A taiga forest is just below that. Um, this is referred to oftentimes as a boreal or coniferous forest. Um, this is still a polar climate zone, not as cold as the tundra, obviously, so we don't necessarily see um, permanently frozen ground year-round. Um, we have temperature ranges uh, pretty wildly from minus 54 to 21 degrees Celsius, and uh, you know, precipitation is still pretty low, 200 to 700 millimeters, so more than the taiga, and that's kind of a distinguishing characteristic between the two. A little bit warmer, a little more precipitation, changes the types of plants and animals that we see in this biome. Still not a lot of sunlight. Temperate deciduous forest distributions here. Um, this is our home biome, so we're familiar with this. These are trees that uh, will drop their leaves in the fall and be dormant for the winter. So our deciduous trees, uh, much of Europe is covered in the same biome. Um, approximate range, we just have an average temp of about 10 degrees Celsius, uh, 750 to 1500 millimeters of precipitation. So precipitation is continuing to increase as we move down. Um, insulation, we get a lot of sunlight uh, in these regions that supports a tremendous amount of biodiversity in our plants. Um, second highest after the tropical rainforest. Speaking of rainforest, not the, tropi not the tropical, but the temperate here. Uh, we have changes in seasons that are occurring. Temperate rainforest is uh, a really kind of specific, not super widespread biome that we see little pockets of. And I think this map is even a little more generous where some of this biome is located. Um, but it has a temperate range between 0 and 32. So we go from you know, freezing to um, warmer summers. Uh, but it gets a lot of rainfall. So it's in a temperate kind of biome band on latitude. Uh, which means it doesn't get super hot like a tropical rainforest, but we still get rain like a tropical rainforest and medium amounts of insulation. So we see heavy mosses and ferns um, in these areas. Our grasslands, these would be our temperate grasslands, the ones that uh, we're familiar with, like in the plain states here in the United States. Uh, flat areas dominated by, by grasses and smaller herbaceous type plants uh, can go from well below freezing um, in the winters to your typical hot summers like we're used to experiencing 250 to 1000 millimeters uh, wide range of precipitation and medium amounts of insulation. The shrublands, real specific biome, not super widespread. Uh, we can see it on the far west coast of California. You can hardly see it up here. Um, then we see some in South America. Uh, around the Mediterranean would be the bigger area as well of our shrubland, also referred to as a chaparral biome. Um, can be a wide range of temperatures, but doesn't really dip below freezing. Uh, 300 to 1,000 millimeters uh, precipitation annually. And uh, this is the mild, wet winters. All of that rainfall typically falls in the winters. Deserts, hot and dry, uh, definitely cold nights. So we get a, a wild fluctuation in temperature on a daily basis. Uh, but daily uh, temperatures are extremely hot, up 41 degrees Celsius or hotter. Um, less than 250 millimeters of rainfall, so very low, uh, high insulation, and limited by water for sure. Uh, our savannas are tropical grassland, okay? Uh, tropical grasslands um, are in that tropical climate zone, so we end up getting a uh, rainier uh, situation, 235 to 1,000 millimeters of rainfall annually. Insulation is fairly high, 
um, and a lot of that uh, rainfall falls in the spring. Uh, but we get scattered shrubs, isolated trees, uh, and warm temperatures. Uh, tropical rainforest, the temperatures uh, just really are, are fairly steady year-round, so between 26 and 28 degrees Celsius. Lots of rainfall, lots of insulation or sunlight, um, typically hot, right? We get broadleaf plants, um, wide range of biodiversity. Um, the only limiting factor is really soil nutrients, and that's kind of due to rainwater kind of washing it away or leaching it away. Uh, but otherwise, there is literally every other unnecessary component for plant life available in abundance there, which is why we see um, such incredible biodiversity. Um, moving to aquatic biomes, our aquatic biomes are kind of broken down into freshwater and marine biomes. So we'll talk about some freshwater ones first. These would be our streams, rivers, ponds, lakes, wetlands. Um, these provide a vital source of drinking water to us as people, uh, but they also provide ecosystem services like transporting nutrients. Um, rivers have a higher oxygen concentration. Moving water tends to have a higher dissolved oxygen, which can support a lot of diversity uh, as well as transporting nutrients downstream. Uh, wetlands and marshes um, are really kind of these terms used to distinguish these freshwater biomes of submerged soil. So we have these um, biomes where some plant life uh, can stick up, but it's mostly submerged year round, at least the roots are. Um, so things like cattails that we're familiar with are in our wetlands and marshlands. Um, wetlands and marshlands are really important for storing excess water from storms, absorbing rainfall into our groundwater aquifers, so just keeping it from running off into larger bodies of water and recharge the groundwater, and helps to filter any pollutants that are there um, in the rainwater or running off. Moving on, we have our marine biomes for aquatic biomes. Um, these are our biomes uh, with our saltwater biomes, essentially. Uh, we have coral reefs, which are typically warm, shallow areas of our ocean that uh, have plenty of insulation or sunlight are required for photosynthesis. So all these areas in red in our ocean are predominantly coral reefs. Uh, these reefs are populated with algae, phytoplankton, and corals, which use the sun's energy uh, for photosynthesis to uh, grow and develop. Um, this supports a lot of biodiversity or different types of fish and other animals that can live in these um, environments. Um, so something like algae provides a, portion, a large portion of oxygen on the earth um, and provides a powerful carbon sink, meaning it takes in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as well, which is something we need. Uh, the next marine biome is just our open ocean. So anywhere that's not uh, red on this map is an open ocean biome. Um, that's not land or red. Uh, they have open ocean has really low productivity, which basically means less photosynthesis occurring um, per meter square. Just you know, think about the middle of the ocean. There's really a lack of large plants. There's really only algae and phytoplankton there, um, and there it's really well dispersed in all that water and space. Um, so per meter squared, there's not a lot going on in terms of plant growth and, and productivity. Um, but it does have the largest biomass and is a significant oxygen producer as well as a carbon sink too, just because of its great size being 70% you know, roughly of our planet. Uh, the final marine biome falls into this kind of estuary category. Um, this is a mixing of fresh and salt water. Uh, mangrove swamps uh, tend to be like a really good example of this, but there are other different uh, unique kind of saltwater marshes and estuaries that can fall into these categories. Uh, essentially, the mixing of fresh and salt water forces species to adapt to, to these higher salinity levels, not as salty as the ocean, um, but not fresh water either. Um, they have really high productivity in these areas because they're at the end of rivers and rivers transport nutrients and they deposit them in these estuaries um, which allows for kind of a, an abundance of um, plant productivity and growth. Uh, so a mangrove swamp is really important. Uh, they're well adapted. They can remove excess salt from their the water that they have and kind of pump that into these areas of, of the plant that they can kind of sacrifice as dead leaves and help deal with the excess salt. Um, they filter and hold the soil in place um, to protect shorelines. They provide habitats for aquatic species. So there's really a lot of value um, in these estuaries as a really unique biome where the fresh and salt water meet.